This video is a re-upload that was originally posted on September 17, 2023. When it got a copyright claim, I learned to start turning the video footage of movies and TV shows transparent to keep it from happening again on other videos. But since the original video is still copyrighted, it keeps the channel from being properly found in the YouTube algorithm, or from allowing me to make YouTube shorts out of it. That is why I have decided to re-edit it for re-release, with also some updated commentary for certain parts of it. Enjoy the new version of the video. Previously in my The Batman vs Dracula video, I mentioned that the movie was supposed to get a sequel based on the Batman Hush storyline, before it then eventually got cancelled. Now, from that thing into another flower pot, in my previous video covering a death in the family, I mentioned that Hush is related, or to rephrase that, connected to Jason Todd's character, so I see it as the natural follow-up video to make next before the hood got red under it. I am so working on something of a Jason Todd trilogy here, with these videos and now moving on to the second installment. Batman Hush, written by Jeff Loeb and drawn by DC Comics now current president, publisher and chief creative officer Jim Lee, originally came out in 2002, spanning about uh, 12 issues of Batman's monthly comic book. Unlike Loeb's previous works on Batman like The Long Halloween and The Dark Victory, which were set during Batman's early years, Hush was set in the then present day, and because of the story also showcasing the then current status quo of Batman's career, it could have rightfully been called the perfect jumping on point for anyone wanting to start reading Batman comics. But, since we are now about to allow two decades later, Batman Hush would probably be more accurate to be called as a time capsule of that era. For either way, these two horizontal group shots drawn by Jim Lee showcase all of Batman's allies and villains who appear in this story, along with the titular antagonist lurking in the background in both. Meaning that the story does indeed in a way work for new readers to be introduced to a status quo for where Batman was during its publication. Also, this trade collection I have also includes a retelling of Batman's origin story homage to one Bob Kane and Bill Finger did back in the 1940s. Once I get over covering the plot commentary, it will make sense why Hush was also among Batman's allies as well as why a 2019 released animated adaptation could have done what this comic chickened out of doing. And because the story is as long as it is, I have cut it into three acts in the attempt to compress it properly without dragging too long. Here are the time codes to each of the three acts, and here is where the post-plot commentary part of the video starts if you wish to skip over there. Also, don't forget to like, comment and share this video for all the work I put into it. And now let's get to the story. Act 1 the storyline begins with a detailed showcasing of how Batman is infiltrating a base holding a kidnapped son of a chemical business empire. As he does so, Batman also mentally comments about how much easier Superman could do this from just flying in and out, not to mention to reassuring the boy on everything being alright. Then when Batman manages to climb back out to the surface of the base, the kidnapper is now revealed to be Killer Croc, whose initial skin condition has gotten worse with his metal gene probably activating, and his rants while attacking Batman seem to indicate that the money he demanded as ransom are to fix him. Batman eventually manages to dodge and counter Croc's berserker attacks to restrain him, just before the Fed show up to realize the ransom money is gone. Activating the cow's heat sensors, Batman is able to see Catwoman fleeing with the money and pursue after her. During the pursuit, Batman mentally knows that just like how kidnapping is not Killer Croc's usual modus operandi, Catwoman does not usually go after someone else's loot. However, as Batman is multitasking that thought process while chasing after Catwoman, he fails to see the line of his rope getting cut, which then causes Batman to fall from the sky down to the streets. Meanwhile, Catwoman delivers the stolen ransom money to Poison Ivy, whose behavior implies that she is controlling her like everyone else she has power over. 
Down in Park Row, Batman is unable to move due to the fall damage he took and his Swiss defenders can just barely keep the thugs and the homeless from getting to him, while Oracle can send Huntress to defend him until a remote-controlled Batmobile arrives. Huntress helps lift Batman's fall damaged body to the Batmobile before it rushes off without thanking her. Without friends, no one would choose to live, though he had all the other goods. Elsewhere, Poison Ivy hands over the stolen ransom money to someone hiding in the darkness. This world has been connected, tied to the darkness, soon to be completely eclipsed. One who knows nothing can understand nothing. In the Batcave, Alfred has done his best to treat most of Bruce's wounds, but recognizes that the skull fractures are too severe for his medical skills to fix. As Oracle reports in that Nightwing can crash one of Bruce's Porsches to set up an alibi, Alfred realizes that Bruce is communicating with Morse code and telling Alfred to contact Thomas Elliot, an old friend of his who works as a brain surgeon. One time skip montage later has Bruce in an operating room where his old friend makes a hero's arrival, and as the surgery begins, Bruce's mind wanders to watercolored flashbacks that showcase his past friendship with Thomas Elliot and how the two were almost as close as brothers. In the real world, Dr. Elliot is finished putting Bruce's skull back together and leaves to tell the expecting reporters, like Lois Lane and Jimmy Olsen, that Bruce is out of danger. We make war, that we may live in peace. Sometime later, when Bruce has recovered from his surgery, he is back out as Batman and gone to interrogate Killer Croc at Arkham about his kidnap and ransom. Or so it looks like, because Batman's internal monologue reveals that he is really there to egg Croc to escape with a tracker placed onto him and follow Croc to where he believes his money is. Unfortunately, because Croc happened to kidnap the son of one of the major contributors who funded Lex Luthor's presidential campaign, Amanda Waller as his secretary of metahuman affairs is also at Arkham to tell Batman that he has until midnight before she sends her people to pick up Croc. While Batman is pursuing Croc, Dr. Elliot visits the Wayne Manor in wanting to check up on his old friend and patient, and to whom Alfred is forced to lie about Bruce being out looking for a date. Feeling bad about having lied to Dr. Elliot, Alfred ends up having a watercolored flashback of a similar rainy night when a younger Tommy Elliot arrived to inform the Waynes about his parents' car crash. Bruce's father being a trauma surgeon so went to operate on them, with the young Bruce being so sure that his father could save Tommy's parents that he promised Tommy just that. Unfortunately, Bruce's father was only able to save Tommy's mother while his father didn't make it, which naturally put a visible strain to the two boys' friendship. In the present, as Batman is driving after Killer Croc, the Batmobile's front tire blows out and causes him to crash. Luckily, it's just a minor inconvenience and Batman is quickly back on Croc's tail, as Croc has made his way to a rooftop greenhouse, where Catwoman has clearly been set up by Poison Ivy as a patsy. Fortunately for Catwoman, Batman makes it to the scene in time to pull Croc off her and attempt to interrogate Croc, but unfortunately now it's past midnight and there come Waller's people to take Croc into their custody. All men by nature desire knowledge. Six days later, Batman is approached by Catwoman to tell him that she knows Poison Ivy is in Metropolis and wants to help Batman in taking her down. And Catwoman is also very convincing to make her case for Batman to let her join in the hunt for Poison Ivy. While Batman is not against the team up and gives Catwoman one of his tracking devices to activate in case she finds Poison Ivy first, he is clearly still thinking about her when arriving to Metropolis as Bruce Wayne and there he runs into Dr. Elliot, which makes them both reminiscent of the previous time they were in Metropolis together, when they saw Alan Scott's Green Lantern fight Icicle. While they also hang out during a shared car ride, Tommy also scolds Bruce as his doctor for not having been getting enough bed rest after his surgery. But by the time they part ways at the Daily Planet building, they are friends who make plans on what to do the next time they see each other. 
In the Daily Planet building, Bruce greets Lois and Clark, with the former attempting to use her charms to learn what the owner of their workplace is doing in Metropolis, and the latter being secure with what his wife does as long as he is the one leaving home with her. Before Perry comes to pick Bruce up, Bruce borrows Lois's computer to contact Oracle on some message boards online about the flowers from the greenhouse, and where they might be grown in Metropolis to find Poison Ivy. With Oracle reporting that ethylene is required in its maintenance, and that plant hormone is being manufactured in LexCorp. So, when the night falls, Batman goes to ask its current CEO, aka his ex-wife and not yet revealed baby mama Talia, who was put in charge of the place when Lex Luthor was elected as the President of the United States, on where that chemical could have been delivered for Poison Ivy's possible whereabouts. While Talia does get him the information, Catwoman activates her tracker to summon Batman and tell him she has managed to find Poison Ivy, as well as that she took being mind-controlled by her as a personal insult that requires retribution. Batman still on the high from the last time they kissed. Let's Catwoman go ahead to try bluffing her way into Poison Ivy's hideout, and then gets into a fight when Poison Ivy knows she is bluffing. Batman then arrives to support Catwoman, but Poison Ivy reveals next that she has managed to somehow get Superman brainwashed into her Enforcer. In this situation, Batman tells Catwoman they need to use the Jawstar family secret technique. <laughs> As Ivy's hiding place was near the waterfront, Batman drags Catwoman with him to the waters, where they flee to the sewer system, as Poison Ivy reinforces her coercion over Superman. In the lead-lined tunnels under Metropolis, Batman and Catwoman are led by Oracle into a position where Batman can plant explosives to the lead-lined walls, before putting on a kryptonite ring and sending Catwoman to do something else. Before leaving, Catwoman gives Batman a morale boost, because this Batman vs Superman fight we get next is more of a survival match, where Batman needs to play time for Poison Ivy's control over Superman to wear off as much as possible. This is why he lies about an opened gas mine to keep Superman from using his heat vision, while punching him until the glove's protection wears out, and then Batman decides to flee when Superman uses his freeze breath on his hand with the kryptonite ring. In his flight, Batman also counters Superman's attack to instead hit high voltage and causes a some seconds long blackout. When Superman eventually blasts his way out of the sewer tunnels, Batman points his attention above them at Lois being held at Catwoman's mercy, out of which she then fights herself free and almost causes Jared's dreams to come true. <laughs> Fortunately by now, Poison Ivy's control over Superman has worn off enough for Clark to resist it and save his wife from falling. Okay, Superman will always save Lois Lane. There is no stakes then. That's just really crappy writing. As a writer myself, I can tell you, if I ever have a situation where I'm depicting something dangerous and the audience just doesn't care because they know what's going to happen, guess what? I failed as a writer at that point. With that dust settled, Batman briefs Superman up on the situation and theorizes that someone must have given Poison Ivy Kryptonite to boost up her control over him. Now back on Batman's side again, Superman makes a pit stop at the Fortress of Solitude to freshen up before they go confront Ivy together, along with Crypto the Superdog and Catwoman who gets to throw the finishing blow at the other woman, as the men watch with varying reactions. With Poison Ivy now in custody, Superman asks Batman why he sent Catwoman after Lois to break him out of Ivy's control, to which Batman answers through circumstantial hypothesis that boils down into him believing in Superman. You'll be here, Alfred, I know it. What makes you so sure? Faith, Alfred! Hearing this makes Superman happy to hear he had given the kryptonite ring to the right person to hold on to, and Batman simply responds to that by asking Superman what friends are for. What are friends for?
Act 2. Sometime later, after returning back to Gotham, Bruce is attending a charity showing at Gotham's Opera House with Tommy, Leslie Tompkins and Selina Kyle, whom Bruce knows to be Catwoman, and she doesn't know that he is Batman. While Bruce's mind is going over his recent experience in Metropolis with her, Opera showing is crashed by Harley Quinn who wants to pull an old-fashioned robbery on the Opera guests. As her ghouls rob whomever they can, Harley singles out Tommy and steals away a jade pendant that Bruce remembers getting beaten up by him when trying to do the same as a child. After Harley jumps back down the stage, Bruce goes to change into his fur clothes, while Tommy also goes after her to get his jade pendant back, and Leslie suggests that Selina goes to do something more useful than try to cover her. When Bruce gets changed into his bat suit, the first thing he does is neutralize Harley's goons, but she is then able to stun Batman by unintentionally shooting down weights that hit his still fragile skull. Fortunately, Cat One manages to arrive and support him by fighting Harley while he recovers, and Harley then shoots Cat One below the shoulder, which forces Batman to catch her while Harley runs away. Batman leaves Catwoman for Leslie to patch up before going after Harley, whom Tommy has managed to catch but not get his jade pendant back, so that pursuit continues. By the time Batman has been able to follow up to their trail outside, he ends up coming across Tommy's dead body at the feet of the Joker. And I might as well summarize the next part of the story being Jeff Lowe's practicing the art of what I would do if I was the hero in this situation instead of the what would the hero do in this situation by having Batman try to mentally justify killing the Joker now for Tommy's death and having it be the last straw after the Joker crippled Barbara Gordon, killed Jason Todd, Sarah Essen and now Tommy. Long story short, Jeff Loeb tried to set Batman up for murder and as I made that video last year on this topic, Batman's no-kill rule should be updated to a no-murder rule, so shit like this can be reinforced to never happen. Harley and even the wounded Catman try to pull him away from the Joker, who with Batman's hands on his throat tries to tell Batman that he is innocent with a gun full of blanks that could not have killed Tom. But Batman is too emotionally compromised to listen to the Joker or them. Pretty much like with Superman in BBS. I understand. In the end, the one who manages to stop Batman from murdering the Joker is Commissioner Gordon, who reminds Batman of the law of justice he is supposed to cooperate with, and that he won't let the Joker ruin Batman's life by making him do this. The punchline to this setup is that the Joker is innocent, as Tommy's real shooter is shown to be on the rooftops and flipping a coin. Missing evidence in the Kellner case. My god, he was innocent. Went to the chair two years ago, Frank. Some days later, Tommy is buried, and as the funeral is attended by Dick Grayson, Tim Drake, Alfred, Lucius Fox, Leslie Tompkins and Selina, Bruce gets an epiphany that he actually does have a bigger family than he has realized before. Later, when Bruce is studying Tommy's death as Batman and having been awake for 56 hours, he is joined by Nightwing and shares with him the physical evidence of how the Joker really was innocent of Tommy's murder, and that there seems to be a puppet master that seems to be able to manipulate everyone Batman has come across since he fought Killer Croc, and even Batman himself when he came so close to murdering the Joker. While Nightwing comforts Batman poorly that at least he didn't get to finish the job, Oracle con Attacks them about Riddler having managed to steal an armored money truck. So they then decide to take one of these many Batmobiles to pursue him. To the Batmobile! On the car ride to Gotham from Batcave, Nightwing brings up how Batman has been working with Catwoman and if there is something more to their interactions. Bruce naturally treats this with silence, which keeps Dick talking to him and tell Bruce not to push Selina away like with all of his previous relationships, and that is where Batman tells Nightwing to mind his own business because they have Riddler in their sights. Batman and Nightwing are able to deal with the Riddler so easily that it might as well be a routine for them. 
during which Batman is able to think about how Nightwing, out of all of his Robins, has become his own man, while Jason ends up dying and Tim is still a work in progress. In the end, Batman deems the Riddler irrelevant to the current events, or at the very least being used without his knowledge, which he bases on discovering ashes from the Lazarus pit at the back of his stolen armor truck. Before deciding to move forward with that lead, Batman decides to act on what Nightwing told him earlier, and approaches Catwoman at a zoo where she is visiting a white tiger, and then unmasks himself to her by justifying it as him knowing all about her, so now she can know him. We can tell this is fiction because Selina takes it as a romantic gesture that makes her and Bruce officially a couple. And while that was happening, Tommy's real shooter is revealed to be Harvey Dent, whose face has been fixed, and so he gets the Joker release from Arkham. One good deed is not enough to redeem a man of a lifetime of wickedness. So it seems enough to condemn him. Indeed. Later Batman decides to follow the Lazarus with Ash lead by trying to get Raj Al Ghul's attention, by kidnapping Talia from her LexCorp 1 plane, which also so alerts President Lex Luthor's attention. But that Chekhov's gun won't get fired until Superman Batman Public Enemies happens. Bookmark that video for a later view if you haven't seen it yet. Ross reacts to Batman's actions surprisingly quickly by sending a sword invitation to the Batcave before Batman returns there and without Alfred noticing. Batman so responds naturally by going to meet with his former father-in-law in North Africa and leaves Catwoman as his current girlfriend to watch over Talia as his ex-wife. While he goes there, Harvey Dent goes to visit Commissioner Gordon to essentially tell him that he wants to defect from the Villains Alliance to his old team, so they can both save Batman from what the Villains have planned for him. Batman and Raj meet to debate over what Batman has done and what Raj might know, before deciding to duel for Talia's release and whatever answers Raj can give to Batman. We'll settle this the old Navy way. First guy to die, loses! Meanwhile, Talia is not happy about her beloved having moved on from her to Catwoman who is guarding her. And among other things, Talia passive-aggressively brags to Catwoman that she has had sex with Batman before her. Before Talia can talk Catwoman to try silencing her, Lady Shiva attacks the hiding place and again, this being Lady Shiva means that Catwoman has next to no chances at winning against her. During Catwoman's beatdown, Talia releases herself from her bindings, beats Lady Shiva when her back is turned, and leaves with those two on the floor. Meanwhile, Batman uses pragmatic measures to end his duel with Raj by fatally wounding him and telling Raj to tell him what he knows so his people can take him to heal at the Lazarus pit. Raj respects his son-in-law and shares with Batman that whomever he is looking for has used one of his Lazarus pits without permission and to somehow rendering it useless. Meaning that someone has likely been brought back from the dead. Batman returns to Gotham with this information to find Catwoman gravely wounded, but otherwise patched up by Talia, who still loves Batman to the point of not wanting to see him unhappy. So, if Catwoman is now to be the source of Batman's happiness, Talia does not want to hurt her beloved by letting her die. Interlude. In the following six pages we have a Catwoman observing and commenting how Alfred is treating Batman's wounds in the Batcave, and realizing all the scars he has on his body from fighting all of his enemies, including her. After dodging that by instead thinking about her old costume from then, Catwoman gives Batman a delayed apology when Alfred is done patching him up by kissing him to make it better. 
Batman naturally walks awkwardly away to work on another lead, while the final page of the interlude is dedicated to Alfred trying to explain Bruce's psychological issues to Selina, while also telling her not to take an advantage of the trust Bruce has placed onto her, and to have a more positive influence on him by going to help him with what he is doing. Act 3 while Catwoman is helping Batman look into the Batcomputer console that Raj left his sword invitation onto, she realizes that Robin is stalking them and draws him out into a brief fight that Batman is eventually forced to cut in half. Even with him in between them, Catwoman and Robin argue with Selina not appreciating on being spied upon and Tim not trusting Catwoman, until Batman unmasks himself in between them to show Robin that Catwoman is his guest. As Tim turns his hostile attitude on Bruce for not having kept him in the loop about Catwoman, she turns to leave in seeing she is not fully welcome anymore and takes one of the bat cycles for herself. As soon as she is gone, Robin drops the facade in revealing it to have been a test of character for Catwoman to verify Batman's trust on her. It is not over yet as next Batman and Robin follow Catwoman overtly to see her be confronted by a rambling huntress. Batman seeing Catwoman fighting back more to defend herself, and to reason with Huntress makes him deem that Catwoman has passed his test. But with Huntress's situation, Batman recognizes that she is the next person of interest close to him being manipulated, and leaves to assist Catwoman in dealing with her, as Robin is left to keep watch and is sneaked up upon by the invisible Puppet Master. Once Batman has thrown Catwoman a sedative to calm Huntress down, Scarecrow suddenly shows up riding on Huntress's bike, and drags Batman grabbing onto it to the cemetery nearby, all while singing The baby don't say a word, mama's gonna buy you a mockingbird. The singing Scarecrow also tries to gas Batman with his fear gas, but Batman has probably grown a tolerance enough to resist it enough to unmask him, and start demanding Dr. Crane to explain how his psychological experience has been used to profile all of his enemies to start acting out of character. Before Crane could answer any questions, he is silenced with a batarang, which returns to the bandage masked enemy in trench coat with Robin at his mercy. As Batman confronts him, the enemy cuts the bandage off his face, and shocks Batman with the revelation on why I decided to cover Hush before under the Red Hood after I did a video on death in the family. Because the identity of Hush was originally supposed to be Jason Todd, and this confrontation at the grave graveyard was supposed to be the climax of the story. The big reveal, and originally they were going to keep they, they were going to keep it, and then they check they check it out. As the former Robin is keeping the current Robin at his mercy and mocking Batman, Catwoman uses the element of surprise to distract Jason enough for Batman to save Tim and physically confront his seemingly resurrected son. As they fight, Jason keeps mocking Batman over his failures on failing to save him, and how he has managed to get a lot of Batman's enemies to play this game that has led them both here. When Batman questions if calling his work as a game is what got Jason killed, the enemy ends up backing away and leading them to the roof of a nearby cathedral. There Batman briefly loses the sight of Jason for him to sneak attack on him, before mocking Batman again on how it has been clear from the beginning who was coming after him. A Batarang cut the line that caused Batman to fall to the crime alley where they had first met, when Jason had been trying to steal the tires from the Batmobile, especially the left front tire that blew out when Batman was hunting for Killer Croc. However, as it is raining, Batman can see that Jason is dissolving, and realizes how Jason has not once called him Bruce, which makes it clear that he has really been fighting Clayface emulating Nightwing's movements and violating Jason's memory. That is what Batman explains to Robin once he catches up, and tells Tim to take the left behind castle to be analyzed at the Batcave. Then Batman goes to see Catwoman about Huntress, who has run away while she came to help save Robin. 
Before giving Batman a piece of her mind for having followed her after she left the Batcave, Selina mentions to him about Huntress having ranted about having betrayed Batman somehow, meaning that she likely fled out of guilt. Unfortunately, they can't question Huntress now, but Batman does not hold it against Catwoman for having left her to come rescue Robin. However, as Jason was revealed to be Clayface, whomever is pulling the ropes behind the scenes is still out there. While Batman leaves Catwoman to look after Scarecrow until the police pick him up, he himself goes to see Oracle for a chance to track down Huntress before whomever they are up against does. While Batman is at Oracle's clock tower, Barbara asks him what exactly caused him to think about Tommy Elliot after he fell from the line being cut and could only communicate with Morse code. Bruce answers by bringing up Tommy's surgical skills and him having been a close friend from his childhood, with Barbara brushing his answer off by pointing his attention to what she has managed to find from the Batcomputer console that Raj Al Ghul had left his sword invitation onto. Whatever that something is isn't shown to the readers, but based on Batman's reaction it seems to be a shocking off-screen wham shot. What in the... Oh, son of a bitch. See. No, you do not! A few nights later, Oracle has managed to set Batman up for a meet-up at the Gotham City Bridge with a man named Harold, whom Batman had once upon a time sent from the Penguin's servitude, and given him a home working on his equipment at the Batcave due to his natural gift with technology. And as these watercolored flashbacks are showing, Harold used to be a mute hunchback, so Batman meeting him as an able-bodied man capable of speaking for himself is more than enough to drop his hostile approach and hear Harold out about how he had been promised his current state of happiness in exchange of doing what Oracle had found out from the Batcomputer. Remembering the man Harold used to be and seeing him now makes Batman understand why Harold had done what he had and is willing to forgive Harold, who still in seeing Batman as his hero believes he can still win against his unknown enemy and is willing to reveal who fixed his body in exchange for the betrayal. But then... Harold is fatally shot twice by the final boss wearing a similar getup as Jason and who has sneaked behind them. What is a friend? A single soul dwelling in two bodies. And so Batman is forced to fight this new unknown enemy, who speaks in whispers by quoting Aristotle. Batman's mind is also distracted in mourning over Harold's death and trying to deduce whom he is facing. That question gets answered rather quickly as they fight, when Batman finds his opponent wearing Tommy's jade pendant and being called Bruce by his enemy. Refusing to believe he is fighting his dead friend, Batman demands to know who he is, with the bandits man reminding him where they are. At the bridge where Tommy Elliot's parents had suffered the accident from which Dr. Thomas Wayne had only managed to save Tommy's mother, which the bandits man claiming to be Tommy then reveals to have been his own doing. Tommy had wanted to get his parents killed by cutting the brake lines of their car for their inheritance, and Dr. Thomas Wayne had ruined that plan. As they fight, Batman is caught in an explosion as the bandits man blows up the Batmobile with C4 he placed onto it before killing Harold. Batman is winded from the explosion and at the bandits man's mercy, but luckily his rescue arrives in the form of Commissioner Gordon and Harvey Dent, whom we have not seen since the latter half of Act 2, so where the app have they been doing between then and now? Anyway, while the bandits man voices his confused betrayal at Harvey's presence, and Gordon is unable to get an aim for a proper shot to save Batman, Harvey in probably channeling his old Two-Face muscle memory just shoots the bandits man to the shoulders, which causes him to let go of Batman and fall off the bridge. Batman having gained his second win jumps after the bandits man in needing to confirm who he is, while Commissioner Gordon does what he knows he has to and arrests Harvey, who still has an existing criminal record. Harvey does not resist the arrest by saying he is willing to represent himself in court, as Batman climbs back up the bridge after not having been able to find the bandits man. Harvey when asked, 
tells Batman that the bandaged man really was Tommy Elliot, who also did the plastic surgery to fix up his face, and that Tommy Elliot's grave only has clay residuals from when his death was faked. However, unlike Tommy and Jason, Harold was not played by Clayface, and he is now truly gone. Of all the souls I have encountered in my travels, his was the most... human. And to compress the post-third act climax's cool time period, Catwoman catches up with Huntress, whose previous fear gas induced rant had implied that the enemy team had funded her new costume and equipment. Batman has called Superman to the Batcave as an audience surrogate to show how Oracle had found what Harold had done to the Batcomputer, aka installed a relay that would flash Thomas Elliot's information when worked on to subliminally make Batman think of him when he needed a surgeon. Superman is also called in to scan Batman's head with his X-ray vision for anything Tommy could have inserted there during his surgery, and surgically burn away with his heat vision. After thanking Superman for the help, Batman goes to see the true mastermind of his operation, whom he was able to identify from Tommy Elliot's medical records, with the alias that Riddler had been using back when he was suffering from cancer. Tommy had not managed to treat it as well as with fixing Harvey's face, but somehow Riddler had managed to find that Lazarus pit, of which Ra's al Ghul told Batman had been used to cure himself from his cancer. Unlike with the usual side effect insanity, Riddler had been granted with the clarity that had made him figure out that Batman is Bruce Wayne, and then convinced all of his fellow villains into the game that was the story's conflict. Not to mention when Tommy had joined the Villains Alliance. Scarecrow singing Hush Little Baby had inspired Tommy to pick it up as his villain name. Fortunately, Batman is able to convince slash threaten Riddler to keep his mouth shut by reminding him that Raj does not appreciate someone else using his Lazarus pits, and that he couldn't have told anyone else Batman's secret identity because the information, or riddle, would become worthless if too many people knew about it. But when Riddler refuses to tell what happened to Jason's remains as his grave was found open and emptied, Batman reacts exactly like an angry father would. Are you little? Finally, this long and extended story ends at the offskirts of Wayne Manor where Batman has buried Harold, and meets up with Catwoman to explain to her how fixing Harvey from being Two-Face, the good man he had once been returned. However, even when Riddler never said that Catwoman would have been a part of the Villains Alliance, and Batman had verified that he can trust Catwoman, her telling him, hush, when closing in for a kiss triggers Batman's paranoia, which Selina reads as Bruce needing some space, and tells him to call her when he can think clearly again. Someday. I don't think I need to say much about the art used in this story, besides the fact that it was a career-defying undertaking for Jim Lee to become recognized as a great artist, and eventually boost him up to be the co-publisher of DC Comics, up until then the deal was fired three years ago and now Jim Lee is fully in charge. Anyway, Jim Lee's art in Batman Hush is detailed, stylish, and the story is full of images that could be repurposed as wallpapers for your phones, computers, and other devices. The characters, the backgrounds, this is art! That is also enhanced by Scott Williams' inking and Alex Sinclair's coloring. Like, look at the shining coming from the kryptonite ring! It is so good art that the sequel story ended up looking like a downgrade, and I still want my money back from having bought Hush Returns. It's a very poor sequel to the actual Hush story. But more about that sometime later, as I still need to talk about this story, and this one flaw I managed to notice in chapter 9, or to be clear, in the latter half of Act 2. Take a look at Lex Luthor's face, with Harvey Dent next to him, and you can see that Jim Lee pretty much ended up doing the exact same thing as Akira Toriyama did when drawing faces, that can only be differentiated by the character's haircuts, of which Lex Luthor and Harvey Dent do not have. Also, Lady Shiva and Talia, who appear in the same scene together, look like identical twins or sisters in general. 
with that out of the way, now it's the story's turn to be criticized, so let's start with the main thing, aka the fact that Batman Hush was originally supposed to be Jason Todd's return to life story, and he wasn't supposed to turn out to be impersonated by Clayface. That is why Hush is shown lurking in both of these group shots of Batman's allies and villains appearing in the story. Outside of the lead-up clues that were pointed out in the graveyard scene, Jim Lee also drew hints of it into the backgrounds where Robin is spelled out, but unfortunately the higher-ups at DC end up getting cold feet about the idea of really bringing Jason back from the dead, and the rest of the story was so rewritten to make Tommy Elliot's death to have been faked and make him be hush instead. As you might have noticed from how I narrated the final parts of the story commentary, that rewrite ended up being somewhat of a messy job. Take this scene from the middle of the first act for example. If Tommy Elliot really was hush, why would he himself react like this to the surgery he himself pulled off? Eventually it took other writers like Jude Winnick to pull off Jason's resurrection in proper, of which I will eventually talk about in that video, and Paul Dini in his detective comics run also went to properly flesh out how and why Tommy eventually became hush by turning his mother into an overprotected helicopter parent who verbally abused Tommy after the accident happened. Dini also salvaged Batman's and Catwoman's relationship that was pushed into this story and broken down at the end, which I do admit was done rather well between the two, especially when this was where it was made to be a thing again after a crisis on Infinite Earths. Dini's Heart of Hush storyline more or less brought them back together, after the time Selina told Bruce they should be apart at the end of this comic, and House of Hush which came out after Batman's MIA adventure following Final Crisis, then reinforced it into what looked like a properly healthy relationship, which then makes it a shame to look back at when their relationship has gone through the New 52, Tom King's Batman run, Tom King's Catwoman Batman miniseries, and what is happening now in the current comics at the time of the writing. It has been almost a year since Gotham War ended, and their relationship keeps sinking into more toxic territories where Batman is simping for her, while Selina is passive-aggressively ghosting him. I don't see anything but a third continuity reboot fixing that relationship anymore. But on its own, Batman Hush could be seen as a flawed masterpiece that set up the new standard on how Batman comics are drawn, especially when it came to adding details to the souls of Batman's boots. Story-wise, it is a good mystery thriller with an interesting journey that does also work as a great jumping-in point for new readers to be introduced to Batman, his lore and characters, as well as in having this real-time narration of Batman's inner monologue being spoken as the situation is unfolding to show how he is truly reacting to everything and what mood he is in, instead of being narrated after the fact. That kind of narration should be taken up as another storytelling norm in helping the audience connect with the main character more, like how it was used in Dexter. I will not kill my sister. I will not kill my sister. Maybe if I don't blink, my eyes will tear up. I could probably kill her before anyone realized what happened. Thanks to Masuka's keen expertise, Deborah will be able to close this case. Evidence will go into a banker's box and be filed away, eventually transferred to a storage facility in Bradenton. And that is where it will stay, locked away, further in the dark. But unfortunately, the story was unable to stick to its landing with the ending it was leading itself up to, which I came to realize not being its fault due to executive meddling. That then leads us to the animated adaptation that came out in 2019 and was set in the DC animated original movie universe. That naturally meant that it would need to adapt out and replace certain characters with other characters and ultimately deviate from the original story. The movie was also written by Ernie Altbacker, whose previous work included the Judas Contract movie, so without having rewatched it yet at this point of the writing, I was already able to imagine where it went while also remembering something worth ranting about, as well as how that something could have been done better instead. You 
Okay, since this is an attempt at adapting Batman Hush, let me quickly get the similarities and other compromising differences in this movie out of the way before the plot ended up deviating and going into other direction. Number one. Instead of having a cold opening like in the comic, the movie has Bruce attending a public event to make a public appearance where he meets Selina and Tommy Elliot is introduced. Nightwing is also in Bruce's calm showcase doing what he does best. Number two. Instead of Killer Croc, we have Bane as the kidnapper in the opening action scene. Number three. Lady Shiva shows up in the middle of it to ask Batman if he knows anything about one of the Lazarus pits being used without permission, seeing how Raj Al Ghul was killed off in the Son of Batman movie. Number 4. Commissioner Gordon is more actively present in the aftermath of the kidnapping to see Catwoman stealing the ransom money. Number 5. Batman is shown to be shot down from chasing after Catwoman by having a sniper rifle shoot the line. And instead of Huntress, we have Catwoman staying back to protect Batman's immobile body from the thugs until Batgirl comes to pick him up and take to the Batcave. Number 6. Catwoman delivering Bane's money to Poison Ivy includes non-consenting girl-on-girl action by establishing that Poison Ivy is mind-controlling Catwoman with her lipstick, and after she leaves, Hush is clearly shown giving her kryptonite-laced mind-control lipstick. Number 7. Since Tommy Elliot was introduced in the opening, Bruce doesn't need to use more score to tell Alfred to call him to do the surgery on Bruce's fractured skull. Number 8. The surgery is pretty much jumped over to Bruce and Tommy having a similar conversation as they had in the comic when in Metropolis. Number 9. Post-surgery. Alfred suggests Batman to switch from wearing the DC animated original movie universe's New 52 inspired costume to a different bat suit that resembles more like the one in the source material. Unfortunately, in my case, it just ends up reminding me of how Tom King made Batman abandon the DC Rebirth costume to a similar bat suit after the wedding got botched. Number 10. Batman doesn't even get to interrogate Bane at Blackgate as Amanda Waller is transferring him to be added to the Suicide Squad before he escapes. And ultimately US are drawn to save Catwoman from him in cooperation with Waller without even getting to interrogate Bane for what he knows. Number 11. Catwoman doesn't take six nights to tell Batman that she wants in on hunting Poison Ivy, and after buying her way into the partnership, they hunt for Ivy's other slaves to learn that she has moved to Metropolis. Number 12. This scene of Bruce Wayne visiting the Daily Planet comes across as if it has less purpose than in the comic, unless this interaction with Bruce, Lois and Clark is supposed to be seen as Batman covertly letting Superman know he is in town. I think Spy Family did this scene better. <laughs> Number 13. Due to the events that happened in the previous DC animated original movie universe movies, Batman goes to get Poison Ivy's ethylene delivery address from Lex Luthor himself, who is not the president of the United States here, and Catwoman doesn't confess to Batman about Ivy's control over her having made her feel violated. Number 14. When Poison Ivy reveals that she has Superman under her thumb and sends him to kill Batman and Catwoman, she also lets us see that she is a sexual predator in reinforcing Superman to do what she says. Number 15. In the fight that happens in this part of the story, Batman has kryptonite brass knuckles in both hands instead of a kryptonite ring in his right, and doesn't end up fooling Superman into causing a brief blackout and Catwoman doesn't give Batman any moral boost. Number 16. When Catwoman is sent to snatch and grab Lois to break Superman out of Ivy's control, she ends up pushing Lois off the roof to also push Superman into saving her. Number 17. 
No crypto the super dog when they go after Ivy again, with them actually interrogating her this time to learn about Hush by name. And then Superman tells both Batman and Catwoman to leave Metropolis in a more hostile terms than in the comic. Number 18. Leslie Tompkins is cut out of the movie in making Bruce and Selina be at the opera on an actual date, which Nightwing lampshades in Selina two-timing Bruce with himself, along with Tommy who has a date of his own. Number 19. Damien as the only known Robin after Nightwing is just shown to appear in a cameo in breaking the unspoken rule of Älä opeta isäs panemaan. Number 20. Harley is shown to be approached by Hush to go rob the Oprah and purposely attempt to assassinate Bruce Wayne, which causes Selina as Catwoman to attack her and get injured with lesser wounds than in the comic. Number 21. This scene with the Joker does not have the same impact as in the comic without Batman's inner monologue reminding him of all the things that this version of the Joker has not done. Since we saw Barbara active as Batgirl, the killing joke has likely not happened. No other Robins between Nightwing and Damien have been brought up, so no a death in the family either. And Gordon doesn't even make any mentions of having a dead wife that the Joker would have killed. Meaning that even with Tommy dead at the Joker's feet, Batman shouldn't be as emotionally compromised as in the comic to ignore the evidence of the Joker being innocent. Number 22. Bruce doesn't read the eulogy at Tommy's funeral. Number 23. Selina calls Bruce before he goes after the Riddler with Nightwing to pretty much confess that she is two-timing on Bruce with himself. Number 24. Nightwing comes across as a little too hyped up about the idea of Bruce sealing the deal with Selina, as if he was more interested at in getting a new stepmom instead of telling his father figure what not to do. Number 25. Batman comes across Hush at a distance when catching the Riddler, and the threat of Hush is what then ultimately makes him approach Selina to let her unmask him. Number 26. We get a bare minimum of the interlude scene where Selina sees Bruce's cars in a post coitus scene before he brings her to the Batcave where everyone but Damien is there to see her. Meaning that we don't get a recreation of this scene with Damien playing Tim's role from the comic. Okay, and that is where the similarities end to be replaced with Ernie Altbacker's original changes to the third act. Naturally, since Raj and Talia are dead in the DC animated original movie universe, the story between here and the Scarecrow's appearance at the graveyard before Jason was supposed to show up is replaced with a montage of Batman and Catwoman working together as a crime-fighting couple, until Commissioner Gordon calls Batman about a break-in at Tommy Elliot's doctor's office. There Batman finds the medical file with the alias that Riddler had been using to learn he used to have a brain tumor that Tommy was unable to cut out, and so ended up using a Lazarus pit to give him the clarity to figure out that Batman is Bruce Wayne. While Batman and Gordon confront him about it in Arkham, Nightwing and Catwoman go to investigate a break-in at the Gotham Cemetery, where they find Tommy's open grave and are attacked by Scarecrow, who ends up taking out Nightwing so that Catwoman look good while taking him out. After sending Nightwing back to the Batcave to recover from the Scarecrow's fear gas and leaving Scarecrow uncuffed behind, Catwoman is then ambushed and taken by Hush, who is revealed to be the Riddler with Clayface covering for him in Arkham. Okay. The Riddler was the brains of the operation in the source material, so I could see where this change came from. But also making him be the muscle of the operation uh, is a couple of steps taken too far. And seeing how I'm covering Batman Hush as part 2 of my Jason Todd trilogy, let me explain how this could have worked better if Jason was Hush as he was originally supposed to be. Batman Arkham Knight already did the Jason working with villains as a revenge on Batman bit, but a collective majority should agree that it was an undercooked story with a lot of wasted potential. See my video on the game for more explanations, but this movie could have redone that premise better by having the Riddler's clarity also include realizing that there was another Robin after Nightwing, and just like he said in the comic, 
Riddler could have decided to use Batman's greatest failure against him by looking up Jason and bringing him back with the Lazarus Pit as a revenant that he could control similarly as with Clayface in Arkham in this version of the movie. Jason's existence and death could have justified the rage Batman had against the Joker after he seemingly killed Tommy by having some flashes of a dead Robin appear to hint why Batman is so angry on top of just Tommy's death and why he would refuse to believe the Joker to be innocent. That could then lead to the climax, where instead of Riddler as Hush, we could have a mentally unstable Revenant Jason as Hush, no longer controlled by Riddler, trying to understand his surroundings and why he has put Catwoman into the predicament she is in. Then when Batman eventually manages to reach them, Jason's memories mixed up with the conditioning the Riddler had put him through would have made him attack and fight Batman, with this fight being Batman trying to reach out to Jason and break through to him as the son he had thought to have lost while Catwoman tries to break herself free. That would have been more emotionally stressful and intriguing than this roast Batman gives to the Riddler while fighting him in the actual movie. Tell riddles a fifth grader could solve and you call yourself the Riddler. Sheer lack of imagination is staggering. A one gimmick hack. The joke of the underworld. You think you've got the best of Ivy, Joker, and Bane? Once they find out Hush was the Riddler, they'll hunt you down like a dog. It won't be pretty. I'm not scared of them anymore! I'll kill them just like I'm going to kill you! Then when Batman eventually manages to reach out to Jason to understand what is going on, we could have a cat one already having broken free and the platforms break to make Jason fall to his death, with Batman being given a second chance to save the son he had once lost, and Catwoman taking it away from him by pulling Batman away from the place as it's coming down. That could have solved the break up that was doomed to happen eventually at the end here, with Batman not being comfortable around Catwoman having taken away his second chance to save Jason. Instead of forcing the relationship to end because Catwoman refused to comply with Batman's no-kill rule, which still should be updated into a no-murder rule and her seeing it as Batman's problem. Also, Unlike at the end of the comic where Selina told Bruce that they can give their relationship another go when he can trust her, here Selina literally tells Bruce goodbye. Goodbye, Bruce. Which by definition means to never see the other person again. It would have been done better if Altbacker had just written it as it was in the source material, by implying that they can't be together now, but someday they might. Actually, the someday line is in the movie, but with Selina having told Bruce goodbye, it just comes across as giving mixed signals about the situation. In the end, this Hush movie ended up coming across as having been done just for the sake of doing it, or so that Warner Bros. Animation could check it out of a list of movies they knew would have an audience. And having it be set in the DC animated original movie universe then ended up restricting its storytelling potential with an established story, just like with what happened with Judas Contract. Also, I said in the Batman and Son and Son of Batman video that I wasn't sure if Jason O'Mara ever managed to find a proper balance for his Batman voice or if we just got used to it, and while I re-watched this movie I think it's the latter option, as his Bruce and Batman voices do not sound as separated as well as with how Kevin Conroy managed to pull it off. I thought about buying a newspaper once. Wouldn't it be something if I owned the planet? Then you and Clark could work for me. No, just trying to get out before they set the night alarms. That wasn't it. Truth be told, I like that about you. I hope you're not entirely tamed. Stay put. I don't think so. He wanted Joker to escape. It was all planned so Joker would wake up in time to free himself as Harley attacked. Then he ran to the opera, arriving just as Tom was killed. It's Delicious Fox, Master Bruce. Shall I put him on the speakerphone? Thank you, Alfred. Lucius, what's up? The design specs? Still safe from the computer, thank heaven. You're right. Ten minutes, Lucius. Thanks. I just wanted to thank you for... at the funeral. That meant a lot to me. It's called wetware. 
the cutting edge of computer research. I'm talking about AI, artificial intelligence, the missing link between computers and human thought. And with a will of their own, they could process raw data a million times faster than we, yet still be able to make the leaps of intuition that inspired our greatest minds. Okay, that was the re-upload of my Batman Hush comparison review. At this point in the original video, I told what videos I would have been working on next, but since those videos are already out, I'll just say that I'm trying to get review scripts written on that new Batman Cape Crusader show, as well as that Wonder Woman animated movie I said I'd do after covering Reign of Superman. Then I also need to get a similar re-edit like this done on my Superman vs the Elite video, which also came out at the time, before before I started to edit the movie footage to be transparent. As for the next proper comparison reviews, I have The Dark Knight Returns and Green Lantern Secret Origins slash 2011 movie also being written into scripts. So, as I tend to say at the end of my videos, while I will be working on those videos, like this video, comment what you think about the comic and the movie, also for the algorithm this time, share the video for more people to see, and subscribe for those videos I said I will be working on next. Also, ding the bell to be alerted for when I will be doing gameplay streams for a chance to chat with me, and may your heart be your guiding key.